you have another word, avoid. Yeah, yeah avoid. Chemicals to avoid. Okay. But, um, that's a good Let me see. Okay. Okay. Now, it's, uh, it's been a bit of a long day. People need to get up and, and get some more coffee or take a stretch. That's fine. I'm accustomed to, to sort of uh, trying to be a ringmaster while doing some of this work here. But uh, um, I was, uh, when I was setting this up, you know, when I come and talk to the uh, sustainable farming systems, I'm always only thinking about uh, cotton and alfalfa. And then when I came in and, and Marcia said, oh, by the way, we need to talk about almonds. So this is how quickly I enter things in. And, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, and that's about as much as you're going to get. But I will, uh, I will address, I think, what I'm going to talk about relates directly to the almonds as well. So it makes a nice, uh, it'll make a nice short package, I think. So key points I want to talk about are just test issues in 2014 or in 2015 relative to, to the field crops that I'm working with. I'm going to talk about our critical use of the Pyrofoss project that some of you already heard about. We'll talk a little bit about the 2015 chemicals to avoid list. And I want to bring up very quickly a new alfalfa project I've gotten myself involved in. I'm going to be looking for some volunteers to help me with it, uh, just very briefly. So uh, pest issues, let's go real quick here. Um, 2014, we had a miserable problem, as many as alfalfa growers know, with the uh, blue alfalfa aphid. It was a problem in 2013 as well. And uh, by the way, that's uh, probably where a lot of the clopyrifos, uh there was a lot more papyrophos use in, uh, in, in last year. I suspect we see 2014 data, PUR data, uh, our friends at DPR are going to be squirming and then coming back to make us squirm a bit. But we have some really, some really big problems with alfalfa aphid, blue alfalfa aphid, uh, to the point where uh, uh, it, it was just really stunting the, 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 uh, the alfalfa. It was something we hadn't seen in over 30 years. Not just here, but all the way down into Kern County and into Imperial Valley and Palo Verde Valley in the deserts. And got it, last year got as far north as Stanislaus. They, uh, they got completely nailed by it and uh, actually had uh, torches and pitchforks that were going after the co-op that was selling chemicals. Uh, and by the way, then got us the, uh, the local, special local needs for um, belief, uh, even if it didn't have a 60-day pre-harvest interval. Um, so, we don't know, you know, everyone's asking why, is it a new biotype? It must be a new biotype. Every time there's an outbreak of a, of a, of a, of a pest that we're familiar with, uh, it must be a new biotype. It must be, high, it must be very resistant to whatever we're using. Just a couple of things about alfalfa that you'll see in a minute. I think it's important for everybody to kind of recognize this if you're an almond grower in particular. Alfalfa has very few materials available to it. Uh, no neonicotinoids are registered. Uh, it, uh, uh, so it's primarily organophosphates and uh, pyrethroids. And so uh, we're using broad spectrum materials out there. We're using materials that we really don't want to use. But A, we have no choices, and B, the bugs are absolutely driving us out. So you do what you got to do. Um, this year, the phone didn't ring at all. I was talking to Jerry Anderson. I don't know if Jerry's here or not. But I was talking to him on the way up. And I said, yeah, I'm really sorry I haven't called. He said, no, I'm sorry I haven't called. And I said, we don't have a problem. I said, I know. I figured if nobody calls me, it's probably quiet. The only place we've seen this problem has been in Imperial Valley uh, this year. We haven't seen it in any other place. It's, you know, a few places have treated. There's a little treatment going on, but nothing like what we've seen in 2013 and 2014. And I think that supports my, my working hypothesis, which was if we have very dry winters without any moisture, then I think we get a high school winter survival rate. This year we had early rains, we had more fog than we've seen in a number of years. The plants were always wet, it was fairly cool in the morning, but warm in the afternoon. And the fungus, I believe, the natural occurring fungus on aphids, I think kept that population down lower. I know, uh, I know the fungus grew, I mean, if, if I had, a, if I had a, 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 a tangerine drop on the ground in my yard, it was covered with fungus in a matter of days. So, Conditions were right for, I think, our, uh, our, our natural enemy uh, in the plant disease world to come in and begin to kind of tamp that population down. And once it's tamped down, I think our beneficial insects then help to maintain it. They're still out there, but not at the, and not at the level that we've seen in the past year. So this idea that we get into uh, climatic conditions that allow a population, that favor a certain population, and this can be true for Leaf-footed plant bug, it could be true for scale, it could be true for lots of things in any of the crops we work with.
So we're always keeping that in mind, and the best job we can do in maintaining our, our use of uh, insecticides is really determined on what kind of pressure we're facing. Everyone knows that. Just cotton real quick, we still have white flies still lurking out there. This area hasn't been as problematic as some of the air, air, other areas. There's complaints again this year from the mills about sticky cotton, which is not a good thing. Uh, they're getting a little fed up with us. They're cutting up, beginning to not to cut us any more slack. Uh, so we're still working on, on that particular problem. Uh, but up here, it, it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem, and I don't, haven't quite figured out why, but I think it's also linked back to this dry winter problem. 2015, just, to, you know, I don't have any predictions about anything, but I have noticed driving down Manning Avenue for, uh, yesterday or the day before coming back from Watsonville, um, there were a lot, besides the fallow fields because of the, uh, of the water situation, um, you know, there is just a lot of weeds out there. I think the only ones happy are the shepherds um, who have their sheep out there. But, I mean, it's not just a couple patches. These are sections and sections as I drive along in there. What I saw just driving along at 55, because that's the speed limit, um, <laughs> 55 miles an hour was uh, London Rocket and a small pot of mustard, that yellow mustard. Both really, really good ligus host. Uh, I fully expect those to be drying out in the next couple of weeks, and I uh, don't know how much they're going to be bothering the cotton come May. But it's other things that could be in there too, as well as uh, stink bugs and such things. I haven't really had a chance to go out there and look at it, but the weed population this year is as good as I've seen for a long, long time. Because I don't think we've ever seen good, good, good winter conditions with the amount of fallow ground we've got, both in full, both retired from, say, Westlands Water District areas, and also stuff that just people have not farmed for a couple of years because there's no water. What about we put a plant bug? Are you hearing anything about it for this year? No. No, I don't know anybody who's talking about how to predict it, but I hear it. I, I, that I was one of the questions I had up there since I got it here on stink bugs and plant bugs. Stink bugs is, by the way, uh, down in Huron, and I understand up in this area, processing tomato conspire stink bug has been a real problem down in Five Points area for the last couple of years. Nasty, nasty problem down there. Uh, most materials will work on it if you apply it directly, but then once you get it, try to get it through that canopy, it's very, very difficult to control. Plant bugs, all I hear about is if you've got, you know, they're all over the place with pomegranates. Um, so I've heard too. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, that's, I, my colleague um, uh, who's working on, uh, on that particular pest was in the field yesterday and brought back, and he's so proud, he's walking down, the, you know, with a, we call it, a, we call it a, uh, an insect hotel, which is just a little tent we have to put bugs in and you can use them to uh, rear them. He's walking along with this thing and there must be, you know, it's saggy with the weight of these plant bugs. Um, they're, really, they're really good sized insects, and so when you see them, you know, they get your attention. Um, there are a lot of them out there. There are a whole lot of them out there. And um, uh, we're talking about, yeah, we're talking about meeting April 9th. Yeah. April 9th to focus on almonds. And um, if Chris can't make it, I'll, 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 I'll come in and, uh, and, uh, and represent as much as I can about plant bug and, and, and what it is in almonds. Um, um, it's, it's, a real, it's a real big issue. They're looking hard at it. They've got some really good, uh, uh, I'll get David Havlin's data. Um, but they've, they've been doing some, uh, some good treatment, uh, insecticide efficacy trials against it. But they don't quite understand where it's moving and how it's moving. You don't have a good lure or a good trap. It flies like a bastard. Uh, it flies like a bastard. Yeah. yeah. You know it hits you, huh? Yeah. yeah. Look, look for it in Aldrich. That's where you'll find it. Where? Aldrich Drive. That's what they like on Aldrich. Aldrich Drive. Right. See that? Aldrich. Uh, where do they overwinter? Pomegranates. Well, we're flying in huge populations all over winter. The pomegranates. That and foothills too, and weeds and yeah. You think up here too? That's that's what I've been told. Yeah. Hmm. Because there, are, you know, because when the, when the, what happens is in Sanger we see it when the weeds start drying down in the foothills, they move out of the foothills and start moving into the almond orchards. The hunting side. Yeah. Okay. Of course, you know we're we're all bastard childs over there. So. But I'm over there with you, man. <laughs> yeah, I've been called that more than once. <laughs> Not child either. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we need to get to hook up and, and, and talk about that. That's interesting because I got a call to get Jerry and I were talking about. I was we spent most of the conversation around here. You know, or particular organic pomegranates are a real problem. Uh -huh. Correct. So yeah, we need to hook up and, uh, and talk a little because I'm curious about what the movement is based upon what. Yeah, like I said, when you start seeing the foothills start drying down, that's when we start seeing the movement in the almond orchard. Interesting. 
I just want to remind everybody our uh, cotton planting uh, forecast is up. Um, it's, uh, it's our five day forecasting for uh, predicting uh, conditions for planting cotton and just let you know it is up right now and working again. We're not working again. It's, it's getting us up, up to the season. And if you can try here from Fresno, it's uh, looks like, you know, based on yesterday's, it was 35 degree days. And with uh, ideal planting conditions like greater than 20, I think everybody's just waiting for the soil to, uh, to warm up to get out there and start planting. So right now we've got really, really good planting conditions, temperature-wise, which is good and bad, I suppose. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about this project. Can I get the light up just real quick? Uh, up, up front here or back there somewhere. Uh, so we're talking a little bit about a project that we're working on. Uh, California Department of Pesticide Regulation asked uh, UCIPM to take on a contract to look at critical uses of papyrophos in four major cropping systems. And these, these crops, alfalfa, almonds, citrus, and cotton, were chosen because they were the top users for papyrophos. Lore's band as, as one of the brand names. And so last year, and some of you were in the room here, uh, we, we convened a series of meetings around these four cropping systems. Um, and, uh, and, and there were three meetings apiece. And we went through and asked the question, what is the critical use? Where can we live with, without if chlorpyrifos is it necessary? And where is it absolutely necessary in the system? Without it, you're going to be screwed was the basic question. And there was a lot of good discussion with growers, our, uh, our, our PCAs, uh, commodity representatives, and we just kind of moved through a process over a period of three months discussing this. The report is um, fairly substantial, although there's a lot of uh, individual information on that. Uh, it's available. I've got some, a bunch of stuff in the back here. OK, let's, let's do that right now while I'm here. I've got, I'm going to hand out some material on this right now. And I apologize once again to the almond folks, but um, uh, I didn't come for, oh, I, I'm sorry, I've got that. Go ahead and start handing those out if you would. Yeah, I've got a couple of handouts that I'm going to talk about. But I've got for cotton and alfalfa, I've got your sections pulled out back there. I didn't do it for almonds. Uh, but I also got a handout there with the website that you can pull this down and just look at those sections you're interested in. One of the reasons why I bring that to your attention is, for every pest that we found we, we consider to be a critical pest, we've got a one-page fact sheet on it. What are the, you know, what is the role of chlorpyrifos in that, for that pest? What are the alternatives? And by alternatives, I mean biological, cultural, and chemical. And, uh, and what are the best practices available? So every one of those pests that, uh, that, that, we've ident that you identify as critical, we extracted a lot of information from uh, a lot of sources to build that up. So what I'm handing out here um, is, again, I apologize. I could have brought the almonds. I just, I just, it just didn't get in the car. But you can imagine this for almonds as well. You've got this one. Well, first of all, let me talk about this. Are you getting this one here that is uh, three pages, just a, just a table? OK. That is all crops that we looked at. These are the compounds that, um, the teams said were alternatives for chlorpyrifos in their system. It isn't listed by pest here, but it is listed by both trade name and active ingredient. So if nothing else, you can fold it over like this, and you've got the mode of action, and you've got a, a Rosetta Stone for, for, for uh... They don't have that. They don't have that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, then check out the uh, printer. There it is. It's coming up. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice collection of common names, product names, and uh, 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 active ingredient names. Uh, and it also has a list of mode of action, and we'll talk about that just in a minute for resistance management. So one of the things you look at, if you just look at that thing, is look down the alfalfa column and then look, compare it to the other two columns, and you'll see that there's not a whole lot registered in alfalfa for uh, compared to some of the other crops. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit, just introduce you to this, these two pages here. And this is in, if you go on the website, you'll find this in the appendix for, for almonds as well, and citrus if you want. Uh, there's one page for alfalfa, three pages for uh, uh, cotton. And what you see on that across the top is, let me see what I've got here. Uh, I'm not going to bring it up yet because I have a slightly different on What you see is the product, 
The key pass we consider where there are no or few alternatives, that's that bright, that's that orange bar, that brown bar. There are few or no alternatives. And then there's a whole yellow set that is important pests with alternative AIs or practices available. And then there are occasional pests with alternatives, AIs, and so basically what we're looking at is in this orange bar grouping here is where the, the pest that Clopyrophos is really, really, there are times when it's really a critical point of the, uh, of the management system. Now why is that important? We really want to reduce our use of Clopyrophos, but we don't want to lose it. We want it in our toolbox to be able to pull it out when we get into those situations when we need it. If you have alternatives, we should be using those alternatives. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. Uh, we should be using those alternatives so that we save Clopyrophos for one, not only because uh, we're, we're, by not using it unnecessarily, we're avoiding any possible accidents of it moving out into the, uh, into the uh, landscape, which is what we're trying to avoid from what Orville was telling us. The other is, if that's the critical part for your management, yet you really don't want to use it out there, if you're using it mid-summer for a pest, say a worm pest that you have a good alternative to, you're exposing those pests to, to, that, particular, uh, to that particular AI, and you could be increasing the pressure on it. So you really want to use that product when you need it. If you've got alternatives, you don't want to have it exposed. Anyway, so... Um, so again, we have one of these for almonds, and you can you can find it on uh, you, you can find it uh, you, you, you can fi easily find it on the website that, that's uh, that, that's available to you. So what we've done is to come back and said, okay, so what are the cultural, biological, chemical alternatives, and um, uh, and what is the best suite of practices that we can do to uh, to be able to uh, to manage this? This is going to be the topic. I'll mention it again, but this is going to be the topic of training in fall and winter of next year. We're going to do 13 trainings across the state on all four crops, and we're going to spend four hours just going through this kind of a process with some hands-on, and we hope to have a really nice decision tool to support that uh, as well. So we'll be able to work through this on, indivi on each individual crop. So this is a list that uh, Marcia and, and, uh, and uh, Jenny have provided, of course, for material chemicals to avoid for almonds. And I just put this up because this is what uh, this is what you probably saw when you when you uh, when you enrolled, and it's the usual suspects there. I'm not familiar with almonds, so some of the fungicides I can't comment on. Um, but certainly, Lord Van Diazenon we heard about. There's uh, there's some herbicides there as well. Um, what I'm going to talk about, and what I could talk about in April as well, is 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 what I'm going to be talking about here for cotton. So or an alfalfa, for example. Here's the alfalfa list that sustainable cotton project provided. I got rid of the uh, and, uh, herbicides and just focused here on the uh, alfalfa. That handout was given to you as well. You should have that one there. This, that, those are colored. Um, where you see these colored in, first of all, all the checks basically. So what I've done is I took their list and I overlaid it with what are the key pests that we were identifying with chlorpyrifos use. And then I, I put a check where you, you know, it, it was it was brought up as an alternative, as an example, to to clopyrifos by the committees and the crop teams, and then I highlighted or colored where we actually had it in our pest management guidelines. So you can see there are places where, for an example, on, on aphid in particular, um, uh, uh, we don't recommend malathion against blue aphid. It was used last year because they were looking for cocktails to kill this damn thing, and, and malathion did come did come back into some use. Um, we don't recommend, uh, we, didn't, we, don't, we don't suggest uh, landing against it either because, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it's possible, it's potentially more disruptive than some others. But you really don't have, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, a whole lot of choices beyond some of these materials that are on the, on the uh, avoid, avoid list. Uh, but you can also see that there's a number, of, most of these are broad spectrum, there's a number of pests that it manages. So this is the same information you saw, if you would, for the almonds, except I broke it, broke it down not by toxicity and stuff, by, but by, okay, if you don't want to you have to use those, what am I going to use? And I'll get to that in just a second. And then here's cotton. Uh, it's, uh, you see the, there's fewer checks there, 
And primarily it's because we have a lot of alternatives to loparifos and some of these others. Some of these alternatives can also could be on the do not use list. Uh, Vitae is a good example of that where we're trying to manage nymphal, nymphal ligus as well. And most of okay, well actually all of the checks there are the product is listed in on our uh, on our on our uh, our pest management guidelines. Okay, so this one I talked about earlier, this colored one, this is more or less the same chart without all the colors. And you can't see it from there, but one of the things I did is I highlighted different colors by the mode of action. And I did this to point out that that for example in alfalfa. There's an awful lot of, of organophosphates. There's an awful lot of, um, of, uh, of pyrethroids that are registered. These, this is pretty much the list for these pests here. So you don't see any of the neonicotinoids, uh, Provato, Admire, uh, uh, Centric, Actera, Asale. They, they've just never been registered in alfalfa. So we're missing a whole set of tools in alfalfa that uh, has forced us to be a lot more dependent primarily on papyrophos for aphid management. So you can see that, for an example, uh, you know, Lord's Band 4E is used across a wide spectrum of pests. And uh, so what I've done now is, uh, what I want to show you is, first of all, let's look at something like blue alpha aphid, where you see the check. You know, you've got the nephoid, there's one, landing, there's another, lower's band, malathion. Um, all of them on the try to avoid list. Mm -hmm. So the question I had was, okay, so what happens if we went through there and tried to do that? Well, what it turns out is for some, let me, let me hit it one more time, I think. Okay, well, let me go back up here. Okay. When you look at blue alfalfa aphid, we don't recommend in our in our biochem guidelines pyrethroids. We, 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 we don't think that because it sets the crop up potentially. We have to use them in the case we got in a few last few years, yes, but it's really a, a, some products of last resort at the very wide spectrum. They can really, really let loose the dogs of war on you if you if you if you, if you, uh, if you don't uh, be careful with it. So in reality, you don't have a whole lot of choices. Um, in this case, it's pyrethroids. It's pyrethroids, primarily. So what we found when you look at alfalfa use, well, pyrophos alfalfa use, you see two peaks. One in the winter, spring, mostly the winter, and the other in the summer. The winter is really uh, aphids, and then weevils if you happen to be going for weevils. In the summer, it could be cowpea aphid. That's a major problem, a major problem. But it tends to be the worms. So this is interesting. So you look down at the worm column, and you go, well, wait a minute, there's a couple of them. Look, guess what? They're both, uh, they're both modes of actions of 28. They're both excellent selected worm materials, belt and corrigin. Uh, Almonds calls it, it's got an important, it's got another name, and, and uh, you use it frequently. Belt and they don't do Alcor? Al yeah. So you're familiar with Alcor. It's a very, very selective to worms, very selective to worms. So we have alternatives there. And um, so one of the educational efforts we're going to be making is, you know, if you absolutely depend upon papyrophos for aphid, you may not want to be using here just to preserve the material because you have no other choices. And in fact, you can reduce your overall use by going to some of these other products. And of course, everyone will immediately say, well, they're more expensive. And I say, yes, they are. But so is water quality monitoring and, and, uh, and other problems in the area. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things where we, we have to begin to sort of look at the whole picture. In addition to which, again, by, I, know, I know a lot of folks in Alfalfa that are using those products for, uh, for worms when they need to. And they're doing it primarily to, uh, to control the worms and also to maintain their beneficial uh, uh, natural enemies. So now we go to cotton, and there are three slides, you've got three pages of, of cotton products. And what is critical, once again, is right here for aphid, late season cotton. Early and mid season cotton, we have a plethora of good selective materials, primarily neonicotinoids, to manage it. But once we get into late season, when you've got all of your investment in your crop, and you get near the end of the season and suddenly you can lose your entire quality. Mm -hmm. Lord's 
Cyclan is, is a really good product for managing. The can, it's a canopy problem. The, the neonics don't like, they are tough to get in there, which is why we use primarily at that time of year 4E, which is the EC. And if our DPR speaker was here, you would have heard about the VOC issue, which you're familiar with. Cotton is the only exemption to using the, the EC or the, or the high VOC product of Lohr's Van during the VOC period, mid-October. And the reason is to protect the lint. We found that the advance just doesn't penetrate the way, in cotton at least, other crops it works just fine. It's a great replacement. But for cotton we find that we really need EC and they can keep you granted based on the, uh, the data put together by the, by the industry. And said, okay, that's one exemption if you get aphids in late season cotton. Because for us, there really isn't any other alternative. That's why it's considered a critical use for us. Just like the critical use for, for early season aphids are in, uh, <coughs> pardon me, um, cotton, or pardon me, I thought. But one of the things I wanted to point out was, okay, so let's go through it again. Is there any, yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's the, the, uh, the plovirophos that would be on the do not uh, use list. And then we also have what I circled here is some more selective reduced risk materials. Um, some are more effective than others. Carbine, uh, flonitamid, you might know, know, know it as the leaf, uh, is a really, really incredible product. Now, that will bring me into, there's a couple of new products that are just on the verge of being registered in California. And uh, you've probably heard of them, probably heard of it as Transformers, Closer, they're gonna be called Sequoia, and the vegetables and native tree crops. Um, it's a, um, a very selective, ligus, aphid kind of material, very, very effective. Uh, they've been using it in, in Arizona now for a couple of years, very effective. And then another, Silvanto. Uh, Silvanto is another that is in the process of, of getting its review, and hopefully in this, the end of this quarter they should have what they said. And again, very selective, honeybee safety, even though, by the way, both these products are in the neonicotinoid group, they're two different modes of actions, close but different, and they've gone through the test with the broods and the rest of it, and they're finding that it has a high level of bee safety. If you spray it directly on a bee, would it kill it? Yeah, but so does everything else on that list. So we know how to manage the pesticides, the insecticides with bees. The problem has been, are they taking the stuff back to the hive? These things they've shown conclusively, in my opinion, that, they, that it's really got a high brood safety. Some of the toughest, some of protocols I, I think I, I've seen the industry go through, and I think they're going to set the standard for them. So with those two products, if those were available, for example, and, I, and I've talked to, we had a meeting, a cop meeting last week, and we had the, the reps come in and talk about their new products and stuff, and one of the guys said something I thought was really interesting. He says, he said he had a PCA in, uh, I think it was Kern County, but he says Arizona was saying the same thing. He says, you know, with these newer products that are very selective on ligus and aphids, or worms, but leaving my beneficials. He says, I can finally farm my beneficial insects. He says, I can finally get it to where by placing them here and there, I'm maintaining all those other guys in there, taking care of white fly now, and aphid are basically being, being really well managed. And so we're back to the point where, okay, now we can really, by proper selection, can really begin to work in, uh, in uh, uh, conserving our natural enemies. <clears throat> so it's, in some ways, we're moving, I consider it, we're moving into a, uh, into some of the golden age of insecticides relative to, to, to selectivity. The issue that citrus brought up is that there are places in citrus where clopyrifos, while there are lots of alternatives, all four of the pests are available at one time, so it means putting four products in a tank as opposed to one with clopyrifos and, and doing the job. And so they said for us, there's a whole lot of, there's a lot more, uh, uh, situations to be considered, and some of the what we consider reduced risk materials in cotton and alfalfa, they consider to be high risk for their beneficial complex. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to manage. If it's going to, you know, if it's safe on lace wing but not on parasitoids, there's there's always this kind of shuffling thinking, uh, trying to manage the system. So I'm just, this is the last one on it. Um, again, the same sort of a thing, but again, if you look down at late season cotton, you can see nothing going on here. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, that's why uh, we, that's why that particular one came, came into the critical. Now, 
let me just see here, since I do have the book. See what the critical ones were for Amund, since I don't recall. So you don't go away going, yeah, this guy didn't tell me anything. Yeah. Um, do you want to lie on? No, I got it. Leaf footed bug and stink bugs, which were they saw the critical use for Clopyrophos, Loris Van Burgh. Then there's a bunch of them for uh, important with alternatives, but still important, including ants, uh, fruit lucanium, navel orange worm, orion fruit moth, pe peach twig borer, San Jose scale, and then the last group, occasional pests with, with alternatives, um, tree borers, ten line beetle, fuller rose beetle, leaf rollers. So the ones that your almond representatives identified were leaf footed bugs and stink bugs. That if Lord's man wasn't available, those pests would be very, very difficult to, uh, to manage. So uh, we could do the same thing with, with that and say, so what all, you know, there are alternatives that people will use because if you're desperate, you have to put something out there. Are they working? Are they not working? Um, uh, is there, are there alternatives on the, into the future that might be able to, to fill in some of that gap? And again, we've got some biologicals. Oh, we got one more of these. See, cotton has a lot of them and a bunch of them are, you know, if you looked at this list and said, okay, if I'm not going to use Vitae, for example, uh, I've got to figure out, make sure I don't get a whole lot of life, uh, nymphs, ligus nymphs getting into the field and hatching and stuff. So, because this is a perfect material for managing ligus, uh, uh, ligus nymphs. But again, with something like relief or carbine, that is not a contact material, doesn't kill it. It just causes the muscles in the head to relax to the point where it can't feed. And so it starves to death. And so it's one of these we've been working with people who use this material and you look at it and say, I have 15 bugs today, tomorrow I got 15 bugs, the day after I got 15 bugs. Yeah, you do, but they're not doing anything. They're just wait, they're dying of dehydration and starvation. So what you need to do is look at the damage in cotton. We can look at the look at the the, the, the square set, the set of the flowers and the buds. And if we're not losing any of those, we're doing well. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of these new materials are working differently than what, we, what we're accustomed to in terms of, of uh, the way they act. And this is one of the more interesting ones that uh, causes a, uh, essentially they, 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 they starve to death because they can't feed. Okay, so what's the next, uh, the next step of this critical use project, which is where I wanted to begin to offer an invitation. We're gonna be doing training for for autumn and citrus cotton too. I don't know why I didn't get up there. I must have put this one in the back just now. But I'll put the four crops we'll be doing training, as I mentioned, 13 meetings. Um, and uh, we're going to be holding them around the cropping system. So there'll be, I think, I'm trying to remember who's, we're, we're beginning to, to gather up the farm advisors are going to be, are going to be our critical contacts on this. And uh, um, I think we're going to be holding one in, um, Maybe at Kearney would be the closest one, and then there might be one up in uh, Stockton, I'm not sure, for, for almonds. Um, so what we want to do with this is, uh, is, is really go through what the report said, what are our options with Clopyrophos, how did they best use it. I'd like to have, you know, what the, uh, uh, we're trying to get NRCS as well as DPR, and if I can get our water uh, coalition uh, colleagues in as well and talk about managing, mitigation, those kinds of things if, if you do use papyrophos. Because there are going to be times, I think, you're going to need it. And that's why we want to show the state that we can use this thing when it's needed and use it in a way that is, is, uh, is uh, 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 by the book, if, if I have to say anything, by the book. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I think that makes a good, a good case for us to say, you know, we may not need it all the time, but when we do need it, we really need to be able to pull it out. <coughs> so you'll all be hearing about these trainings, and we're looking forward to getting uh, to getting people at these. And uh, with that, we're going to have uh, have it set up, and we're going to uh, we're going to be doing this kind of talking head stuff. But we also want to have some discussion in the group about about what people are experiencing, what, what works, what doesn't work for them, and then we're going to try and get uh, some kind of hands-on kind of experience for folks as well. So we break up this rather long training session. Just an FYI. And just finally, I just want to mention all, you know, all non-alpha people who put their heads down now, because this will only take a minute though, is we got funded, uh, surprising to all of us, uh, on a national grant. Uh, we're one part of a very small $7 million grant, very small part of it. But they were looking for people to come in and say, would you be willing to help us on this iPad? 
And IPIPE stands for Integrated Pest Information Platform for Education and Extension. What it is, it's a computer-based platform that they developed for soybean roast. And they did it because soybean rust was moving up so fast that they, they couldn't track work. They were having trouble tracking, so they set up a platform that people could say, I think this is soybean rust, I had it confirmed, and they could put it in the computer, and then suddenly the dots began to appear up and down the map of the, of the Mississippi Valley. So they can see how quickly this thing's spreading, and where it is, and you can go right down to, to the county kind of level. <coughs> so they said, well, this is really great. It, it could be useful on lots of crops that have invasive or exotic species. So they put a call out saying, does anybody have a crop case study they'd like to put forward? And I said, yeah. He said, I'd like to put alfalfa forward, because this was right in the middle of our blue alfalfa aphid problem. And the best we had was a telephone back and forth. And some guy says, yeah, I just talked to somebody who talked to somebody who saw it over here. And somebody saw it up there. And a telephone call comes into me. And I'm trying to get the information back out to everybody. I said, I think this kind of a thing could really work well, where we can take it, record it easily. It's, it's checked for accuracy, and then it can be placed on. So all those who, who are putting information in can have access to the site and, and can see just, just where the pest problems are, where they're developing, et cetera. Um, uh, they call it, their, their, their uh, slogan for this project is progress through sharing. But I have to tell you, I was back in Raleigh with the group, and it was one of the most interesting groups I've ever worked with. These guys are gangbusters are ready to go. There's a group that will do them, will create, I mean, we've already got a beta on, a, on an Android and an iPhone where you can actually put the data in. I mean, I just said, well, this is the things I want. And they said, great, here it is. And the next day, there it was. They've got folks who are doing, uh, they want to model. They'd like to be able to do some modeling. That's one of their big things. They've got a really incredible crew of particular pathologists who do aerial modeling of spores in the air, all that kind of stuff. But I said, well, you know, we have the old alfalfa weevil model. Maybe we can resurrect that and see why it's working or not working, for example. But second, what we talked about, what I talked about earlier with blue alfalfa aphid, is it connected to the amount of dew out there or moisture in the air? These guys can, they've got models that can simulate what leaf wetness should be, even if we don't have any, any uh, direct evidence. So we can look at 2013 and 2014, then look at them, then go back and say, so find me another year that represents 2013, 14, does anybody remember if they treated it? And how much was it treated? I tell you what, if you go back to the PUR, the message I used data, that's the record in stone about, you know, people are putting on a lot of materials in February, March, April, February, uh, January, February, March. It's probably weevil and or aphid and maybe mostly aphid. So we can go back and actually say, if in fact we could correlate a weather pattern to the outbreak, then we could go into the future and say we would predict that this thing's going to be bad. There's potential for getting bad this year. So that's the kind of modeling stuff that these guys could do for us and are ready to go on. So it's kind of an exciting opportunity to draw in all this sort of other expertise. But I want it to be as practical as possible. So I'm putting the word out right now that I'm going to be hitting folks up to see if I, if I can get half a dozen people across the state to at least try the beta version this summer and start working on it. Uh, it would be a, it would be great. I know Carlos is going to be has already volunteered. Didn't need to know it yet, but he did. <laughs> and the input looks something like this. This is just a really rough one of what we're starting with, but this would be sort of like the one you put it in once. Variety, location, uh, 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 maybe some field name kinds of things. So so it's a record for for you to sort of keep. And then I asked him to put some cutting information in here so we can kind of track it through cuttings. This is what we came up with. This thing is very, very elastic. We can change it. That's why I like to meet with people and say, what would really be useful? Then on sort of a regular form, it's basically you've got the alfalfa, you have field name, the observation data automatically fills in here. The growth stage, and I asked him, I said, I don't know what growth stage is, but it turns out Dan Putnam in the alfalfa manual has alfalfa has nine growth stages. Okay, fine, we can put those in. The pest, and all these things are going to be drop down menus. You don't put a thing in, you don't have to type a thing in. Uh, so you, I'm going to have them change this to common names. So here's five pests we'll be watching for. Um, the number of pests, we're going to ask them to be doing, I've asked for natural enemies, but I don't want them to count the natural enemies. I want the, the scout to say, to have, it's going to be a little slider, low, high. And they just slide that thing over, you know, and say, okay, it's, you know, what I, that's how I used to report it 30 years ago is, Big eye bugs are abundant, highly abundant, or very infrequent type of thing. And then you just don't, you just slide this little thing through. So that's the kind of stuff they want to work with us on. And uh, 
They seem to be a bright group of people who respond. So for those in alfalfa, I just want to throw that out. If it works, um, you know, I'd like to compare it to some of the other programs that are also out there, because I know there are a lot of them commercially available. And what they would like to do with the programs, if you have a particular guy, I know Agrian has kind of a little bit of a program that's built more around trapping. This is the first one I've seen actually that it's, it's more about the sweeping. And, uh, and then I know uh, Wilbur Ellis is coming out with their own internal program and lots of other companies. These guys have basically worked with the commercial folks to say, can we tap your data and in return, this is what you can get from the data from the analysis. So they're finding other sources also of drawing in where somebody already has their own program set up. They'll take their data, convert it into this format so it can be set up onto a, uh, essentially onto a map. So on that, I'm going to stop. Okay. That yeah. mean, I don't know. And, and could that go to other talks? Huh? Could that, that phone app oh. thing move on to other Well, let me say they're working with apples in the Northeast and in Utah. They're working with soybean in, um, in Mississippi. They're working with sorghum in Texas. So these guys can do anything they want. I mean, so actually what we need to do is the call will go out for, we're doing it for the first couple of years. Uh, we're the, sort of the first, the first wave of this. They're going to calls me going out again. We need to get the lighter to say an omnibus advisor to say, yeah, I'm willing to do this in omnibus. And they'll just take what you saw there, turn it into omnibus. So, yeah, it could work. So, questions? Questions? <laughs> Did we finish on time? Yeah. Cool. So, <laughs> so thank you all for coming.